Well, good morning, or good afternoon, I should say, and good morning if you're based in the United States or Canada, um, and good evening if you happen to be dialing in from Asia. Um, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this webinar on North America as an origin market. Um, it in many ways symbolizes um, a, a cooperation that we're forging with uh, the Canadian Tour Operators Association and the United States Tour Operators Association uh, in these very, very trying times. Um, it's important at moments like this that we cooperate. And I'm absolutely delighted that we're being joined by Brett Walker, who um, not only heads up um, Colette uh, for, um, for, for, for for, for product uh, in, in North America, but he's also chairman of the uh, Canadian Tour Operators Association. Uh, we will be joined in a couple of seconds by um, uh, Terry Dale, who's the president of USTOA. And I'm also delighted to have uh, Justin Reed, who's um, head of product for EMEA uh, at TripAdvisor, who will be giving us some insights. Um, normally, I would be um, talking about the importance of the origin markets that we're about to discuss. Um, and in, on one level, one very obvious level, there, are no more, there is no more impo important origin market for Europe than North America. Um, Canada and the United States together, according to UNWTO, deliver in the region of 41 million visitors. Um, the trouble with the UNWTO data, brilliant though it is, is it tends to count every visitor who arrives in each individual country as a visitor. Um, so the aggregate that they come up with is probably far more than the, um, than, than the total visitors arriving. Um, I think uh, the, if you look at the US, US Department of State data, they say there are about 17 million visitors from the United States coming to Europe in 2019. And I think it's probably fair to say that probably th three to four million visitors came from Canada. Even with those reduced numbers, it means that 21 million visitors would normally come to Europe from those origin markets. And this makes it by far the most significant origin market for Europe. That was in 2019. Uh, 2020, we had been expecting a good year. Uh, predictions were looking at a five to 10% growth um, in these areas. And we have not seen that. Um, as we know, we've seen uh, really what it can only be termed, termed a catastrophic falling off in demand. I would be surprised if we saw even 10% of those figures by the end of this year. And that presents real challenges uh, for everybody, for suppliers and for um, the intermediaries that Cato, USTOA and ETOA represent. And it's partly uh, to ponder on this and to partly look at how uh, we might climb out of this and what the, the indicators are that we're having this, this webinar today. Um, whilst we're waiting for Terry to join us, um, I would just like to hand over to Justin very quickly uh, to give us an insight as to what TripAdvisor is seeing in terms of uh, market sentiment. Justin, good day. Lovely, thank you, Tom. Um, let me just kick the presentation off. Uh, someone can give us a thumbs up if they can see it. Oh, right, well, I can see it, I think. Excellent. Right. OK, so what we're looking to um, what we're looking to talk about now is very much um, the TripAdvisor lens on the North American market. Um, if we go to what we what we what we've done of uh, late was we started off with uh, some surveys that were done of the uh, US market, not the Canadian market, unfortunately, but the Australian market. Uh, and the Italian market and the Japanese market. And this was back in um, this is back in around May time. So some of the questions that we asked were around um, when would people uh, think about traveling again um, domestically um, in terms of uh, with it after COVID. So back then there was 97% of responses from the US market, from the UK market, et cetera, as to when they would feel most, uh, when they would feel confident about traveling again. And back then 66% of these respondents said that within, within two months they'd feel comfortable about traveling. Now, again, stressing this is the domestic market. And, and what we're looking at now is, again, these are just TripAdvisor figures. So um, in, in August of, uh, of this year, we actually surpassed 
last year's numbers in terms of domestic lookers. So UK people looking at the UK uh, on TripAdvisor. So that was actually up 9%. So in some respects, if we look back at the survey that was asked, which was when you feel um, confident about traveling again, and we did start to see restrictions being lifted within the UK, you know, about uh, June or so. So again, that very much reflected the reality. Um, clicks to book is how TripAdvisor measures sort of bottom of the funnel uh, activity. And again, within the UK domestic market, we saw that uh, by the end of August, it was actually back up to only 14% down year on year. Incredibly good, uh, pretty positive. Now then, that same question was asked of international travel, and these are looking at the results just of the uh, the US market. So again, apologies to the Canadians, um, but we were only able to sample a certain number of markets. And again, the same question was asked, when would you feel confident um, about traveling again uh, after COVID? And a combined number said that within six months, 89% of them would feel like uh, traveling internationally again. Again, if we look at that from the, uh all markets globally so all markets globally uh in the month of august was again just about back to um back to where it was last year bookings or rather clicks to book which is where we would pass them off to an ota that was still down 31 percent. but you know if you look at the the bottom um the darker purple line you can see that in both cases of all markets not including the uk looking at the uk the road to recovery was very, very much there. Um, now then, United States looking at the UK, okay? So we can see that that big bounce back recovery that we saw for lookers, for the domestic market, uh, which was plus 9%, and even the global numbers of all markets, look at the UK, which it almost recovered, we can see that unfortunately, the United States has, has very much flatlined. Um, a slight lift in August in terms of lookers, but we're still 68% down, we being, you know, uh, the UK in terms of lookers. And bookers, bearing in mind this is just hotel bookers, not necessarily attractions, um, that's still down 90%. And basically the drop off we saw uh, in March dropped a bit further in April and has just stayed sort of, um, you know, flatlining somewhat since, uh, since then. Is some um, some stuff here for Canada, of course, uh, but it's a very similar tale. So North America at this point can almost be encompassed into one and that, you know, lookers are down and bookers are, are way down. So as Tom suggested, or not Tom suggested, but, you know, firmly stated, you know, the, the North American bounce back really hasn't kicked in yet in terms of uh, people coming back to the UK. Um, this again looks at uh, uh, international booking window um, this year compared to last year. And we can see that uh, from North America coming, uh, actually that's North America looking anywhere uh, outside of North America. It's 68 days longer than what it was last year. So in other words, people are still very, very hesitant to, um, you know, commit to anything within, within uh, 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 a two month-ish period. Now, this is where things, this is where we look at things from a, um, well, a number of perspectives. This is the first column on the left. This is, uh, nine, oh, sorry, 2019's data for the same time period as COVID. If we, if we consider COVID as starting at the beginning of March for the UK, um, this is the same period. So this is March to end of August 2019 and compared to March to August, you know, 2020, the COVID period. Now, last year, it was very much dominated, uh, again, as Tom said, by the United States, far outstripping um, the numbers of lookers and the number of bookers on TripAdvisor, skewed slightly by our, in, our own uh, huge, huge audience on, uh, in, in North America. But nonetheless, it's clear that this time last year, United States was uh, was dominating dominating proceedings. Normally at this point I'd say, and guess what it is this year. But in fact, just to reveal it, it's not as bad as you'd think. So yes, the United States is significantly down, um, but it still leads the way very firmly in terms of lookers and in terms of um, you know what we call click to bookers. Canada has actually gone up one place. It's overtaken um, the Netherlands. Oh, no, it's not the Netherlands, is it? Anyway. Canada's actually it's held its position or gone up, um, but again the numbers are are significantly down compared to the previous year. 
Now, what we're looking to do now is look at the, uh, the, the actual raw numbers. So in terms of where the US market has gone. So if they're not coming to the UK, where are they going? So this again looks at the 2019 numbers. Uh, and this looks at the 2020 numbers over this time period. Um, and again, Tom quite rightly mentioned that uh, we reckon roughly the US and Canada combined would be bringing in just over 20 million. Uh, that was for the whole year. This is for just half the year. So we can see that of those you know, 20 million, at least half of them were coming to TripAdvisor um, before they venture. But again, what's interesting there is the UK, you know, the overall numbers of people coming to the UK from the United States, yes, it's down, but the relative numbers, uh, you know, you we, there's not a discernible place where you're losing market share to. Um, so again, looking at the numbers from the US, uh, the US domestic is down 40%. The Caribbean is up, it's down, sorry, uh, 63%. Mexico's down 60%. We all know that, know that um, actually, I shouldn't be too assumption, but certainly when I worked at Visit Britain, the assumption was that if you didn't have a passport, I think you could travel to the, to the Caribbean. So that obviously increased their numbers. I'm not quite sure if it's changed or not. But we're actually, as in uh, the UK, is doing better in terms of the, the decline than compared to Canada, Italy, or France. So again, you wouldn't call it reasons for optimism necessarily, but it's reasons not to get too panicked in the fact that the UK isn't falling further behind uh, with either of these two markets. Um, sure, every market's losing out, but it's not as though we can point to uh, to any specific winner. So I just want to cover off those things uh, as sort of a background as to where we are uh, within the TripAdvisor world. So, um, you know, suffice it to say is like, you know, there's no point in candy coating this. Uh, times are hard. Times are tough. Um, but the, the slight bit of uh, optimism, it, it's like it's like it's not like we've lost 20 percent of our market share to uh, to to Italy or to uh, to Mexico or something like that. Every country is uh, is struggling as much as anyone else. Uh, in the US, including, somewhat surprisingly, um, domestic travel over there. So that's my sort of like kick off uh, starter points. Um, if I direct it back to you, Tom. Well, um, uh, th thank you very much, Justin. I, I would like to say on behalf of all of our members, uh, most of what Justin said concerning the UK applies to the whole of Europe. Um, and um, uh, those people based in Italy and France will uh, not be consoled that the UK is doing better on according to TripAdvisor than Italy or France. But I think um, the crucial point and the crucial point that you're raising here is that people are still interested. Um, there's a real, there's still a desire to travel and that desire far outstrips their ability to travel. And we know at the moment travel is extremely difficult. Um, countries are closed. Um, airlines are not operating on anything like the volumes they were. It's tough, uh, but there's still a real desire out there. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Terry, who's made it from Fire Island. Uh, is the weather okay in Fire Island? We were worried about the, the storms. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. There we go. There we go. So anyway, the weather, it's a little dicey, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad I finally got connected. And it's great to join you here, Tom. And Justin and Brett, we haven't chatted in a while after a string of many early calls. So I think um, I want to be a little more hopeful. Uh, obviously, I learned a lot from Justin's presentation, but I'm going to start with referencing an American Express study of their cardholders. And in that study, they found that four out of five consumers missed travel the most of any activity which is roughly 82%. And I, I guess that's not surprising, but it's somewhat reassuring that travel is top of mind for those, those cardholders. And then um, I also want to reference a survey that we've been doing consistently throughout the pandemic with our, our tour operator members. And we are starting to see uh, new bookings consistently rise with each passing quarter. So in, in the first quarter, of 2021, a third of our members had new bookings. By the time we get to the second quarter, two thirds had new, new bookings. And the pattern continues like that as the year progresses and even into 2022. So I can't uh, speak to the volume of those bookings because it's something that we don't ask. 
But I think that it, it demonstrates that consumers are at least generating new bookings for our members. Therefore, the intent uh, is there. And I think it's only going to continue to grow. So those are, um, I think, some, some encouraging tidbits. And certainly for our friends in Europe, because as you know, um, out of our top 20 destinations, 14 are European countries. So it's, it's top of mind for all USTOA members. And I think uh, it'll obviously continue to be that way. I think um, another trend that I call small is the new big. You know, we started seeing smaller groups as a trend a couple of years ago. And I think that that's just gonna continue to escalate uh, until we get well past this pandemic. So I think we're gonna see these travel pods or a travel bubble where people travel with families and friends that they trust and know have been responsible during this pandemic. So that travel pod will translate into those small intimate groups that want to go together for an experience. And then I also believe something that we'll see is what we call meaningful travel. And that's the opportunity for our members uh, and stakeholders to create experiences that get our economic impact into those businesses that really can use it to create jobs and better the lives of those communities. Uh, we have been working on this program with Tourism Cares and have done some um, product in Jordan and in um, Colombia. And I think that we'll see more of that because sustainability will be elevated in the minds of our product development teams. And part of that is meaningful impact where we can make a difference. So we need to be optimistic as an industry. And there are indicators out there that uh, we will turn this corner. It's just a matter of when. But at least uh, I think as the champions of the industry, uh, part of our responsibility is to give some glimmers of hope because they're out there and we'll, we'll get through this. Um, Brett, I mean, let's turn to you. I mean, is that broadly the situation in Canada? <clears throat> I think so. I think the, uh, the tenor of the discussion is changing a little bit. Um, certainly from a Canadian perspective, one of the big challenges we have here, and it's not unique, is the 14-day quarantine. Um, so in terms of, uh, Tom, what we've talked about before, pent-up demand, I think there is pent-up demand. And um, I think that pent-up demand is largely in the form of a smaller cohort that is ready to go uh, to Europe or anywhere once the 14-day quarantine it disappears. Um, perhaps maybe a little bit unique to Canada, I'm not sure, uh, Terry, um, in the US, but um, with the suspension of travel as of March 15th with the, uh, or, or in and around March 15th, a lot of tour operators here in, and, and travel companies here in Canada were providing future travel credits as opposed to a refund. And so I think there is, uh, again, a significant group of people who is um, interested in using up those future travel credits when the time comes. Um, even if they're not entirely comfortable with traveling, they may want to use them up before, you know, they go. Um, so um, we, we've had a government here that has, the messaging has been fairly binary um, for the last six months. Basically, they've been, in my opinion, sort of a betting, I don't want to say fear, but certainly a uncomfortable, uh, uh, a lot of the public feeling fairly uncomfortable about going out certainly traveling, um, by creating a very binary message, which is basically stay at home or potentially risk getting COVID. And um, the borders closed, obviously, with the US has been for some time. It's been extended now through the end of October. However, however, again, the, the tenor of the conversation is changing. There is much more talk about recovery. I'm, I, I stayed up late last night. Well, I think some other people may have been watching a debate. Uh, I was watching. Um, our Canadian Parliament uh, was sitting uh, to try and pass through a stimulus bill, which I'm happy to report uh, was passed unanimously uh, by all parties, which will greatly help the industry here. But more importantly, is sending a message that we're focused on recovery, because that's really what it, it, the, the, the Bill C-4 that was passed here in Canada is about two things. 
It's about um, maintaining the health of um, an industry which desperately needs it right now that's in, in pretty bad shape, but also focusing on the road to recovery. And for that reason, they were able to get the support of all parties, which is terrific. We expect more details. So I guess in short, Tom, yeah, I think we're I think we're a few weeks or months off from a much more positive um, frame of mind for most Canadian consumers. Uh, and and that was interesting, Justin, to see the trends with regard to future bookings because you're right on. Um, I can take off my. By the way, Tom, I think you gave me way more credentials than I deserve, but I can take off my my uh, my Cato hat for a second and put on my my Colette hat, and that's what we're seeing exactly. We're seeing that bookings, for the most part, any new bookings that we are getting at Colette, are for that June and beyond period. Um, and I wish it, I wish we had uh, more interest in first and second quarter. But the good news is that from June beyond, we are we have a very healthy booking uh, trend, and we're we're happy about that. And in large part, that's Europe. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's I good news. Sorry, Terry. It, I, I just since Brett uh, mentioned uh, the debate that we experienced last night, um, I just have to say, you know, every four years we get that same question. Does an election year impact travel? And it historically does. But what we witnessed last night was devastating. Uh, what the, it must have shook, everyone's shaking. <laughs> like how, how do we get through this election? So on top of a pandemic and race relations and all the major issues our country is facing, uh, I don't see how this, doesn't hurt the psyche of the U.S. citizen for some time, you know, because it was it was very disturbing. Well, look, I would I, I, I can't comment. This is um, it's a bit like um, our own domestic so our own domestic problem political problems in the in the U.K. Um, I think they're for domestic consumption. I would reassure you, uh, but the. Um, one thing you raise is do does the united states and north america travel in an election year we did actually a, a cert, we did some research on that and it's available on our insight hub and it's it's mildly surprising i think i could if i if i can reassure you on that front i think what was raised really interestingly earlier was the point that we have um not having a captive audience is perhaps not the best audience but um it it's undoubtedly the fact that a lot of the people who booked in 2020 um, have rebooked for 2021. Um, undoubtedly, some of those have no option other than to rebook for 2021. But that presumably provides us with a foundation uh, to build on. And it looks as though we've got real desire to travel that. Um, I, Justin, you, you were producing some really interesting data on um, you know the click to book ratio at the moment booking now is is pretty unfeasible what i'm fascinated with is, is that you've still got a lot of lookers there i mean is there any prospect of this going up uh yeah absolutely um and sort of tagging on to brett's point um about you know what are the influences for allowing travel or, or not allowing travel um it's regardless of it, not political with a capital P, but political with a small P. We see it on a daily basis where, um, for instance, the when when the Germany to the UK uh, air bridge was put in, in that very week they went up 34 percent in terms of bookings. Now that was 34 percent on the previous, the average of the previous three weeks. But you know, as soon as that opportunity to travel, which was back in June, was presented to them, it was like, yep, yeah, let's go. Um, likewise, uh, when we're looking at inbound, sorry, outbound for the UK, which I know is not the point of this conversation, but outbound from the UK, we'd see huge double digit um, increases and decreases on a daily basis, depending on what the, the government initiative was for that particular week. And Tom, I'm sure you'd join me in saying that like, things can change very quickly in terms of what government uh, policies are. So there's no doubt, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, the demand is there, and the only really thing stopping it is 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 it's not even the COVID the COVID infection levels. It's the the ability 
to travel in and out of countries without having to like you know either quarantine for two weeks or face breaking the law you know those are the things right now it, it, it in a way it's a lot of it it was is within individual government concerns and again going back to what uh, i think it was brett or, you know, sorry, apologies if it was you terry was um you know the government has always it seems to be at the minute certainly in the uk and for what you're saying in, in canada as well it, it's like you know that fear is the number one factor that they're playing off and you know it, it just doesn't seem to be to anyone's mind that you know the full effects of like the entire the entire um hospitality sector is, is almost they're prepared to sacrifice it at the altar rather than you know uh look at what the long-term positive effects might be of you know getting people in and out and traveling again well i you know i i don't think there's any doubt that um governments are playing on fear um they may say in their defense that they need to um i think we would probably all disagree with that but i, I we're, we're stuck in a real political arena on that. Um, I think um, more to the point is what will it take to get this market going again? Um, uh, we know that a vaccine is, we, we perceive as being the cure-all and it's possible that may come in in the second half of next year. Certainly we're hearing rumours to that extent. Uh, but a lot of people are putting great stress by the, on the idea that there's going to be instant result testing at airports. Um, do you think there's going to be any scope for this to boost confidence, or do you think that's a red herring? Uh, Brett, what's your opinion on that? I, I think, Tom, it's, a, it's very much a layering effect. I think there will have to be a number of things take place for consumer confidence to go up, and I think they're happening already. Um, we've been reading about the airlines doing rapid testing, United now to the US, and, and Air Canada and WestJet um, is doing some rapid testing, albeit it's on a voluntary basis and does not um, negate the fact that uh, returning returning uh, Canadians or visitors need to quarantine. But basically what they're doing is they're providing data to the government. I think a vaccine or even talk of a vaccine will help. Um, and I, again, I think it's just, uh, it, it's, there's probably any number of things which will have to happen, Tom, and I'm not sure altogether what they are, but it's gonna have to be a number of things, including the rhetoric that we hear from government, we've all talked about it, has to take on a more positive tone for consumers to begin to think about, I'm not ready to go maybe right now, this month, this quarter, but I want to travel. And it seems more likely that I can travel and to book. Terry, have you got any angle on that? Well, I, I want to go back to your comment twice before I went up. <laughs> and that was about rebook business from 2020. And in June, on our survey to our members, we learned that 57% of business on the books for 2020 had transferred to 2021. So to your point, there is a foundation there, if we're able to travel, that successfully transferred to next year. So it, that's encouraging. I think um, I also want to say, in my conversations with all major airlines, and United was referenced, but all of them sooner rather than later are going to be able to offer rapid testing at the major hubs throughout the U.S. So that's another step in the right direction. And when it does get a lot of good press, United certainly did within the last couple of weeks, when these announcements are, are coming out and they're being rolled out. So I think to Brett's point about we need positive news, that layering effect can and will start help happening. I also want to touch on the work that uh, our colleagues did with USTOA because I think it's one of those layers in building consumer confidence, and that's the tour care program that we collectively created. And in our most recent survey, we learned that 50% of our members have adopted that guidance that we created. 20% said they're in the process of using it, and the rest say, we haven't made a decision yet. So I think um, that helped. And what I've learned also is that what we delivered, we knew was kind of a base. And most of our members are going in a much more robust direction with their own internal programs. So again, that's one more layer to build that consumer confidence. And uh, I wanna thank my colleagues for uh, helping through that process. No, oh, well, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was one of those few instances, talk care program, by the way, 
you can uh, find out about that by visiting either the, the Cato USTRA or ETRA websites. Um, it's a, a, a customer reassurance campaign. Um, I do feel, if I may step out of my role from being chairman, that the um, it's it's great to talk about things like tour care and trying to make um, uh, tourism uh, COVID secure as much as possible. It's great that we're talking about rapid testing at airports. But when we discuss these things, we're focusing on the things that people fear. Um, and the balance that people have to do in order to travel, in my opinion, is that they've got to think that the experience on offer is worth the risk. And this balance of experience and risk is something that uh, takes place throughout the travel history. I mean, we, we were looking at this with the terrorism scares. We've been looking at this with, with health scares in the past. And what we need to do is boost up the value of the experience because trying to minimize risk focuses on risk. And uh, we've just got to find a different narrative, in my opinion. But insofar as people are worried, we've got to answer those worries. There's no doubt in my mind. So I think the initiatives that, that are taking place are good, they're justified, they're right, but they're not going to solve the problem. We've got to get the idea that coming to Europe from, from ETOA's point of view, coming to Europe is an unmissable opportunity in 2021. You will never see a continent um, so free, so open, so welcoming, so competitively priced, and so devoid of other people, as you will in Europe in 2021. It will be the ultimate experience. But this is a, um, you know, this is for, this is for broadcast uh, when 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 there's some scope of demand flooding back into the market, and we're we're a way away from that at the moment. And um, one thing to kick in there, Tom, if I may. Uh, part of the survey that we did, which was a minimum of two thousand people per per market, there was five markets involved. So it was a strong, robust study, and they were asked what 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 will make you travel again, um, or, or paraphrasing what will make you travel again, and the the questions were. If the economy has returned, uh, a vaccine has been found. I can't remember the third one, sorry. The fourth one was, or the country restrictions on going in and coming out have been lifted. And overwhelmingly, the number one answer, I think like 65% were government restrictions being lifted. So there's a confidence beyond uh, a vaccine. So there is a positive thing there. They literally say, let us travel and we will travel. Um, remove those restrictions and we will travel. We don't have to wait for the, the, the economy to come back to where it was. We don't have to wait for a vaccine to be found. Let us travel and we'll travel. So there's some positive to be said with that. Well, look, um, well, well, on that note, I'm just going to launch a, a poll for those people watching and you're going to see the screen disappear and you're going to see a question pop up. Um, and we're just think, saying that uh, thinking about traveller sentiment and European product development, which of the following do you agree with? I'd be really great if you just click one of these. Travellers will be looking for less crowded destinations. Travel recovery will be domestic neighbouring destinations. Operators will offer new normal programmes and operators will offer new destinations and attractions. You will notice that these options, and I think you can click more than, oh, you can only select one, I do beg your pardon. Choose the one you agree with. Um, while you're looking at that, and I will close this poll in roughly one minute, I'd just like to ask, um, uh, Brett, which one of these you, would you plump for if you were being, well, as you are being presented with this question? Which do you think um, is the most obvious answer? Uh, all of them, but um, choosing one, I think the need, my knee jerk reaction, Tom, would be looking for less crowded locations. That's interesting. And why do you say that? You just simply because they're going to be frightened of crowds. Yeah, it, it's it's top of mind. I, I'm not sure it's the most important consideration, um, and that's why I mentioned my knee-jerk reaction. But I think the one thing that a lot of people are fearful of right now, right now, is um, any crowding. And we've been conditioned to being two meters apart, three feet, four feet, whatever it is. Um, and um, the idea of lineups or queues are are people don't want to do that and I think that's why we're seeing more and more timed entries I think that will be a factor of any any uh, group experience in the future so I would say less crowded and uh, so th this is not the year to sell Pamplona as a um, as a feature Terry uh, what's your opinion on this yeah I I concur with Brett uh, it reminds me of this country Western singing group here in the States 
previously called Dixie Chicks. However, they've dropped Dixie because of what's going on. The Chicks had a song years ago called Wide Open Spaces, and it was extremely popular here in the States. And I think that that is going to resonate. They're going to want to have space. They're going to want to have nature, be outdoors, and less crowded, less, less crowded locations certainly fits that bill. I mean, all of these, I think, are relevant and will resonate. But I would, I would concur with Brett. And Justin, you got, what's your opinion on this? Hello? Uh, yeah, for some reason I can't see the screen, so I'm going to agree with my two colleagues. Okay, that's <laughs> kind of the answer. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the poll because uh, a lot of people have voted, and I will tell you as I close it that the overwhelming, well, the, the winner is that travellers will be looking for less crowded locations, uh, with 45% of people agreeing with that, and 37% agree that travel recovery will be domestic or neighbouring destinations. The third question comes third in the li list with 14% think that operation, operators will offer new normal programs and 3% think that operators will offer new destinations and attractions. I'm going to close this poll, we can get back to the screen. Um, thank you. I, I, at new normal destinations, do you think uh, tour operators will be offering different products? Do you? I'm just intrigued. Terry, what's your take on this? Well, I, I think that they will. And I'm going to go back to a point I made earlier about meaningful travel and also, you know, will sustainability factor into how products are being developed? Uh, I hope. I think it, it's um, certainly become more uh, critical now than ever. So I, I, I believe uh, there will be new programs, new ways of showing a destination that maybe we hadn't thought of. Maybe over the years, we kind of get stuck in a rut and we offer a very similar program. But I, I think uh, our members are certainly well aware that we want to do what's right for the destination and for the consumer. And that means we've got to try new things. So, we'll And that, that very much fits in with the USDA Tourism Cares Initiative and all the things that you strive for, I suppose. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's not so much the bucket list, it's more or less how the bucket list is decorated with um, other um, other criteria. I mean, uh, Brett, do you, do you feel the same way? Yeah, I do. And I think this trend was coming anyway. I think the pandemic has expedited a growing trend, um, not only for um, new types of travel, similar to, well, could be small group, but also kind of off Main Street. Um, you know, we can still go to many of the same destinations, but we all won't go to the same place. And a perfect example of that, Tom, I was I mentioned on my on a call recently that I just got back from Banff, Alberta, which many on the call have probably heard of. And and um, Banff is doing a very interesting exercise trying to get people to visit locations off the main street. And so it can accommodate a lot of people, but it's not going to accommodate everyone in the same way. Um, I definitely think that we will, um, again, putting on my tour operator hat, I think the days of having um, a group dinner uh, or group meal um, is gonna change to more or less go as you please. Um, there may be certain locations uh, which are included, uh, but people can choose to go where and when they want. Uh, so I, I just think that this was a, this was a it may be a sea change now. It was happening anyway. And I think it's going to benefit everyone. Justin. Yeah, absolutely agree. The only thing I'd sort of preface it with is there's a, a, a sub opportunity for those that are prepared to or, or are able to move now. I mean, the whole C Rome or C Santorini without the crowds, you'll never get a chance to do this again. There, there, is, a, there is an opportunity for those funny pots or, or, or the, the tired and trusted ones. To really capitalize on the fact that like you know you'll never ever be able to experience these cities again with the luxury of of no other tourists basically um but there is an opportunity there in, in the short term there's one of the ironies of our industry is that um tourists don't like other tourists it's um uh, if we could solve that little conundrum we'd be um uh we'd be happy there are instances incidentally where the opposite is the case um Famously, uh, Visit Wales did a, a tourism campaign 
where they focused on the deserted beaches of Wales uh, and showed these pictures of these completely wide open empty spaces and everybody assumed there was something wrong. <laughs> um, so it doesn't always work is my appeal. If you don't mind, I'm going to go to the next poll. This is very useful for our, our research data. It's just simply uh, another question, which is, um, have you noticed changing product interests and requirements from clients? So it's certainly, it's there to um, um, back up the discussion we just had. Uh, have you noticed changing product interest requirements, requirements from clients? It's choose just one of these. No change. Clients are seeking new health and safety assurances. Are they? I mean, it would be really good to know. Clients, is, clients are seeking different products destinations. Clients are seeking products away from cities. Clients are, are more interested in small groups or FIT. Just pick one of those, please, and I'll close it in one minute because we, we've got a few more things to cover. Um, tell me, is there, um, can I go back to just a more specific, not a, um, a, um, not a, a coronavirus related question, just to break free of it for a few minutes. Um, Brett, is there anything specific that you think Canadian um, tourists look for um, when they're looking for a European vacation as distinct from um, the United States? Is there any, is there any sort of differentiation in that area? Oh, that's a good question, Tom. I'm not sure that there is anything too different. Of uh, Obviously, Canadians may have slightly different travel preferences in terms of where they want to go. But in terms of uh, any sort of driving, um, anything that might drive their, their, um, their decision, I think it'd be very, very similar to the US. I can't think of anything offhand. Uh, that's good. And, and do, you, do you perceive any differential, uh, Terry? I mean, the answer could be no, but um, I'd be fascinated if there was. Yeah, Tom, I'm not aware of anything uh, significantly different, so I really don't have much to insight to offer you there. Well, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the poll, and then the short answer is on this poll, is that the overwhelming winner in terms of uh, what the people watching this webinar has said, is that 41% of you think that clients are more interested in small groups. Um, and there's a definite drift in that direction. Um, that's hotly followed by no, no change or it's too early to say. 3% um, think that um, clients are seeking different products and destinations. Um, so that's the loser. 16% um, think that clients are seeking products away from cities and 12% thinks that clients are seeking new health and safety assurances. So uh, that actually broad bring, broadly brings out the point that Justin was making and the other two are alluding to, which is health and safety assurances are there and they have to be made, but they're really interested in going and they're just blocked by the way in which governments are behaving. All right, I'm gonna formally close this and we can go back to the screen. Um, how can we, uh, this is a sort of political lobbying question um, to both Brett and Terry. How can we shift this discussion? One of the problems we've got um, here in Europe um, is to do with um, the, 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 not the, not the, the poor um, status of tourism in Europe. It's just that it's the most easily sacrificed thing from a government, governmental point of view. And I dare say in North America, you have exactly the same problem. One of the first things uh, that they think is almost an easy victim is outbound travel. And they go, well, hey, that's not gonna affect us. So let's let's make that difficult almost. Do you think that's the case? Is there any way of turning it around? Uh, Terry, I mean, I know you have uh, lobbyists working for you in, in Washington. I, yes, yes. I, I think it's uh, in this current climate and with this administration, the easy answer is no. Doesn't mean that we have stopped as an industry. You know, we work closely with the US Travel Association in DC along with our lobbying firm. And we have a call virtually every day about you know, what's going on on the Hill, how that impacts our members and our stakeholders. And we are trying always to have consistent talking points, but it's, it's just an ongoing process. We will never get over the ultimate hurdle 
because you know the house will change every two years so there's always a new class of you know representatives that we have to make sure they understand the value of the industry so i i think it's just it's something that you have to be very persistent with will we ever get to a place where we would like to be not in the near term yeah. uh brett well, I think Canada might be a little bit unique in that it is, unlike the United States and unlike the European Union, it is a very, very small market. We have 37 million people. We reside in the Northern Hemisphere. We have a Canadian winter about to uh, land on us. Um, the domestic uh, domestic market is you know, all but done. Um, Canadians are not traveling too much within Canada other than to visit friends and family, perhaps in a given winter. Uh, where do they go? They're going to Florida. Typically, they're going to Europe. They're going to Portugal. They're going to all kinds of uh, winter destinations. We're not going to see that in the short term. But, uh, you know, I don't, every government around the world is spending far, far too much money and they're running out of it. And I think, um, again, the, the situation in Canada is that it's imp it will be impossible, impossible to invigorate this this uh, industry without outbound travel. And if the government doesn't do something soon, we're going to see companies fail. Um, the stimulus the, the stimulus programs alone cannot keep companies going on forever. Um, so I'm I'm very optimistic that we're reaching a point, uh, an apex, if you are, a brink at which in the next month or two or three, hopefully, I mean, things could change, right, health-wise, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that the government is gonna have to begin to make some concessions and just live with an imperfect solution. We're never gonna have, as Terry mentioned, we, we, there's no perfect solution here. We have to just figure out which is the best um, imperfect solution. And, um, and and taking taking uh, every measure we can to, to live with that. I, I, I'm hopeful that um, we're gonna see some progress in the in the coming weeks. Um, Justin, do you have an angle on that? You're on mute again, I'm afraid. I was going to say, uh, Brett and Terry are much closer to the grind in terms of the outbound um, mechanism. I could talk more about it from an inbound point of view, um, um, you know, how countries would invest more and are, and are starting to invest more in getting people to come to their destination. But in terms of propping up uh, stimulus packages for Canadians going outbound or Americans going outbound, Brett and Terry know way more about that than I do. I, 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 all I would say on this, and um, it, it, it's, it, it's a long expressed frustration um, in the travel industry and indeed amongst travel associations uh, that uh, we always appear to be the victims in these circumstances, is that both Canada and the United States do have heads of state with vested interests in the tourism industry. Um, uh, you know, famously, um, the United States has a, has a president with um, extensive interests in hotels and resorts. And Canada has a head of state with extensive attractions, admittedly inside the UK, but she's she's got skin in the game. But even then it doesn't seem to make too much difference. Um, we've got questions coming in from our, sorry, Terry, you're about to say something. I was just gonna ask you a question actually. And that, the question is about reciprocity between our respective governments. And how big of a role do you think that that will play? Because I think you had shared with me on a call some time ago about when Trump made the announcement that he was closing borders or our borders, that Germany and Italy were really pissed off. They weren't given a heads up or asked for any channel of input. So will that play into this? Is it going to take us first to open a border before we're going to be allowed over to Europe? Look, borders are being closed not for, I mean, my reaction is that borders are not being closed because of real scientific advice. And there's no doubt that um, this pandemic was caused by people traveling. I mean, this, that we, we have to admit that. But it's, it is what it says on the tin, it's a pandemic. Uh, it's everywhere. And it's not exacerbated by people traveling now. They're closing borders because they can, and it's something that they need to be seen to be doing. 
And when they're, when they're in that kind of mood, um, asking for reason, rationality, and reciprocity, this isn't on the agenda. It's to do with the cephalogical charts. It's to do with what do their focus groups say they want their governments to be seen to be doing. And that's the market, the, the, that's the environment we're in at the moment. Yes, we can screen, and we do screen. Um, if it's any consolation within Europe, uh, the European Commission is screaming blue murder at the individual nation states within Europe uh, to open up and coordinate their, their measures. But the nation states within Europe are naturally, this is what politicians do, catering to their audience. And their audience, if their audience think they need to hang tough, the politicians will hang tough on that front. And travel can go and dance as far as they're concerned. Look, I've got some questions coming in from our audience. Um, uh, someone has just said, um, should we campaign for airport testing upon arrival instead of quarantine to help build customer confidence? I think the answer is actually in the question, but it's a question, so she'd like an answer from all of us. Do you think that would be a good idea, Brett? Uh, testing on arrival. Well, I, I'd be, I, 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 as a traveler, would be a little bit reluctant to get on a flight to to travel to Europe to be tested on arrival and told I can't enter. I think the testing has to be done before departure. Um, that's my quick take on it. Terry, uh, I absolutely agree. Um, there, there's too much risk involved by showing up in a country and then being told that you know you have um, a positive test and then what do you, what do they do you, you stay 14 days in a hotel room so it, it needs to be done in advance of travel i think you're right uh, yeah sorry this is me saying <laughs> agreeing with you justin would you agree with those sentiments yeah i mean cyprus and abu dhabi are two examples of where you have to have a a, a negative test to even you know to even get on the plane or get in get in the car as it were if you're driving from dubai to abu dhabi it's the best way before you go i've never heard cyprus twin with abu dhabi before but now it's right. going to be very, very similar very similar in many ways uh right we've got one more polling question which is uh, the um uh the, the 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 crucial one and i'll um i'll um I'm just trying to choose the third one is thinking about the recovery when do you think the first significant wave of visitors will arrive in europe uh 2021 2022 or 2023 um i'll launch that and uh why don't i ask the panelists this question because uh, we're gonna um find out what the audience think any second uh brett when do you think this is gonna happen well if it doesn't happen in 2021 we're all in trouble tom um, yeah. I, I think it depends, whatever a wave means, uh, it has to happen in 2021. Uh, again, with my, with my corporate hat on and not so much a Cato hat, but I can tell you it's, uh, my, my opinion would be shared by Cato. Things are looking very good from June onward uh, currently. Assuming all things stay relatively the same, I think we're gonna see the first wave, beginning of the first wave sometime around June of next year. Okay, Terry. I, I totally agree with Brett. Uh, I'll go back to the survey results that we have done of, of our members. And clearly it's showing that um, May, June is when we see the greatest uptick. And again, if everything stays relatively normal and we can start traveling, it'll, it'll be mid-year next year. All right, Justin? Bear in mind, I was famously quoted as saying back in the beginning of March, oh, this will all be done and dusted by the beginning of April. I'm probably a bit too optimistic, but I'm going to go 2021. Have to. Right. OK. And the poll, for what it's worth, uh, the winner on the poll with 54% um, or 53% as I speak now, some people are still voting, is 2022. But a close second at 41% is 2021. So. Uh, the audience is slightly more pessimistic than the panelists. Um, I tend to, for what it's worth, agree with the um, the panelists. I think 2021, second half, we'll see some action. I think the there is everything to be said for um, the uh, a, a, some form of virus cutting in um, late in Q2 and the industry getting going in uh, Q3 and Q4. 
um, of 2021. But 2022, we hope is the period for recovery. Um, some quick notices very fast. Um, I'm delighted that we have both USTOA and Cato here. They're cooperating uh, and very kindly extending invitations to our global European marketplace, which is taking place on October the 30th. And um, Cato members and USUA members are taking part in this event. If anybody wants to um, take part in the event and they haven't registered yet, um, we, have over, we have 200 tour operators already registered. So um, do join us. You can join, find the link very easily on our website. I hope this is the beginning of a really important co period of cooperation between the three associations. It's at moments like these, moments when clients are thin on the ground, that um, tour operators, intermediaries add value. Um, we sometimes know that um, uh, destinations and certain attractions and suppliers don't look at us too kindly in a high season. There is no high season at the moment. Um, we are here to deliver business to people just when business is wanted. So um, I think this should be a golden period for intermediaries and those people doing business with them. Now is the chance to talk. Now is the chance to plot the recovery in 2021. And the business, of course, being discussed in all our events at USUA and E2A will be focusing on 2022 because that's the planning window we're now looking at. So the recovery starts here. Um, I would just like to stress that the Catalonia workshop, which um, this um, webinar is taking place in the midst of an online workshop focusing on Catalonia, will start within the next four minutes. Um, it's really up to me just to say thank you and just check if anybody wishes to say anything extra. Um, Brett, do you want to say anything in particular now? You're on mute. You're Sorry, just to thank you, Tom, very much for the for the invitation being here today. Um, much appreciated. Terry? Yeah, I would just say uh, I personally am trying not to use the R word, which is recovery, because I feel that that implies that we're going to go back to what we had. And we'll never go back to what we had. We need to reimagine right now the future. And so, uh, I try not to say the R word. Okay. Suitably visionary. Thank you. Uh, Justin, you can say goodbye if you want. Yeah, I was going to say goodbye. I was also going to apologize to the rest of Europe for not including them in, in all the stats. And as a, as a confirmed Euro, uh, Europhile, I feel incredibly embarrassed about that. But uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Not at all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank, you. thank you, my panelists, for being there. We'll be doing more of this, I hope, next week. Um, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now.